But today here we are in Chile and we're going to talk about drinking and driving in Chile. Not necessarily together, but I think two things that you can enjoy. And we're with Grant Feltz, a winemaker from New Zealand, but you've been in uh, Chile for a long time. So how are you, Grant? Pretty well, thanks, Javier. So thank you for being with us here in, uh, we're in Portillo, actually. The ski resort is uh, two hours and a half northeast of Santiago, right? East, yep. So beautiful uh, re ski resorts. We got lucky. We got like nine inches of snow overnight, which is great. It's pretty good. <laughs> exactly. And um, Grant has his uh, wine tasting, his yearly wine tasting. I don't know if you did more than once. Twice a year. Yep. Twice a year. So let's talk about drinking or driving first. I think drinking first, no? <laughs> because you make wine. Well, that's yeah. That, that's got to be my priority. It's, it's a lot more fun than driving, so, at least in my case. Exactly. So you're, you're from New Zealand and you've been uh -huh. here for that. What, how long? 14 years. And what brought you to Chile? The wine. I mean, I trained as a winemaker in New Zealand, and during the 90s I was uh, making wine for some English companies basically all around the globe as a flying, what's called a flying winemaker. So I would go into to wineries under contract, uh, work for three to six months just for the harvest, get the wine ready to be bottled. Uh, like and a free agent. Like a free agent, but these were wines that were being made for the English supermarkets. So, you know, with those guys, I worked in California, worked in Australia, Hungary, France, Argentina, and eventually I wound up in Chile, and that was, as I already mentioned, 14 years ago. Obviously liked it because I decided to stay. Yeah, and they like you because uh, you're pretty good, too. Well, you know, it's, uh, the thing I like about Chile is that if you find the right winery, the right fit, then you uh, essentially get free reign. And I think, you know, for me it's a little bit easier because I've got a lot of international experience. When a winery hires me here to, to work as their chief winemaker, they tend to hire me because they want me to change the wines and they want a new direction, they want a new style, and that's what they're looking for. So uh, it's kind of a and carte blanche, uh, if you like. Yeah, and obviously you've been very successful doing that, right? I mean, because you were at, uh, you're now at Casas del Bosque? Been at Casas del Bosque Casa now. Casablanca Valley? For, for, yeah, I've been with those guys, for, these guys for five years now. Casablanca Valley, which is a cool climate region. Uh, before that, I was seven years as head winemaker at a winery called View Manent, which is in the Colchawa Valley. It's a little bit harder. It's a little bit more akin, say, to Napa Valley in terms of climate. And the winery I worked for specifically was a real Malbec specialist. So for seven years, I was really concentrating on Malbec over here. And uh, I understand that winery, View Manent, wasn't in the top ten, let's say, of Chile. Uh, and then you, you turn it around. Pretty good, right? Well, you know, it's a joint effort because uh, together with hiring me, they also uh, improved a lot of their sales and marketing. So it was kind of a combined effort, but definitely uh, I sort of rocked in there. I think they had a portfolio, portfolio of about 12 wines when I started with them. When we left, it was something like 29 different wines. We started making a Malbec in Argentina. Uh, so it was fun. We added a whole lot of wines to the portfolio. We started looking for new terroirs doing more interesting stuff and with that we kind of made a push to open up new export markets, find new importers and obviously the style of the wine changed a lot uh, during the seven years that I was there. Really probably in the first two years it was a very dramatic change. So you know as you said it was fun, um, you know when I left the winery it was the number one ranked winery in Chile uh, the, the year that I left so that was a nice Nice result, you know, I really feel like I left that winery when it was peaking, you know, sort of, yeah. that's, that's, that's ideal. So, let's talk about a little bit Chile in general, because a lot of people know about Chile, a lot of people don't, uh, so why should people come to Chile, uh, not only for wine, but for what else? Well, I mean, we're here skiing, obviously the skiing's pretty good, uh, I mean, Chile, more than anything else, for me, it's about nature. I mean, I'm from New Zealand, which is a, it's a very pretty country. Everyone's seen Lord of the Rings. Everyone kind of knows what it looks like. Very beautiful country with a lot of different cli a lot of different uh, landscapes within quite a small space, which is the nice thing about New Zealand. You can drive for 45 minutes and be somewhere completely different. Chile's a little bit like that. I mean, it's 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 the longest, skinniest country in the world. It's about 3,000 miles from top to bottom. It's only about 110 miles wide on average. And I would say, in fact, that Chile has a greater range of landscapes than even New Zealand does, because yeah. in New Zealand we don't have that, the deserts that they have in the north here. And the south of Patagonia uh, is, is much wilder, I think, than any, any part of New Zealand in terms of just wind and rain and that extreme sort of wet climate. So I think Chile is a great place if you love the outdoors. Uh, cities, I mean, you know, Santiago is a cool city, uh, but probably if, you, if you're into cities, the best thing you can do here is go to a town called Valparaiso. That's where I live, actually. To Beautiful. visit you. <laughs> yeah, to visit me. Come and hang out. Uh, I have two guest beds. There you go. 
Uh, no, Belpres is a great, great city. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's a city that was rebuilt in a very short space of time in 1906 after they had an earthquake and a tsunami that wiped out all of the light sort of wooden structures, essentially everything residential yeah. that was on the flat part of Valparaiso. And so everyone moved up into the hills, rebuilt with the, the cheapest construction material at the time, which was available, which was corrugated iron. And they painted the houses with all the paint, which back then they stole from the shipyards. So yeah. it's this crazy mixture of... It, it looks like a Dr. Dr. Zeus book, essentially. So it's, it's a very cool city to visit. Uh, and then, you know, I think Chile, the other plus it has is food and wine. Yeah. Lots of great fresh seafood. Um, there's a lot of, sounds a bit weird, but actually probably the best cooking here is mainly Peruvian. I heard that. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I mean, Pretty good ceviche here. Yeah, because they, they tend to not overcook the seafood. I mean, it's a Peruvian style yeah. of cooking. So lots of great ceviches and scallops and just fantastic fish in general. Uh, and the wine. I mean, the wine's great. Chile's been making wine for almost 500 years. Uh, Casablanca, where I am, has only been around for 30 years. So it's a new valley, and it's the first cool climate valley that was ever planted in Chile. So right now we're going through a bit of a re renaissance in Chile in terms of cool climate viticulture. These new cool, cool climate styles of wine coming on the market. I mean, you are at my tasting last night, so you tasted a few of them. Uh, we tasted five different wines, all from our one vineyard. It's, it's 12 miles from the ocean. Very foggy, very cold site, and we pick most of the grapes in in your equivalent of November, yeah. even coming to December. So, which is incredibly late for somewhere like California. So, it's a cool site where everything ripens very, very late, and we make a very distinctive style of wine. I think that's something that's interesting, and, and you know, it's happening right now in Chile. So, it's, it's so fun. so distinctive that you have won some awards recently. I heard, right? Like the best uh, Sauvignon Blanc in Chile for this year. Yeah, I mean the national biggest national wine competition. We we had that in July, and we took out the trophy. The best Sauvignon Blanc of Chile with our new, uh, actually our entry-level Sauvignon Blanc, which is the Reserva 2014 vintage, which is already available in in, uh, in Florida with ABC. Yeah, that's great. So uh, let's talk about driving now in Chile. So we drank a little bit and then you, you wait a few hours, or let's let's separate it completely. Driving in Chile, it's very strict uh, laws, like pretty much zero tolerance, right, for drinking and driving. Well, it's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, when I moved to Chile 14 years ago, I really... It really grabbed my attention that that drink driving was so prevalent coming from New Zealand, where where no one drink, dr essentially no one drink drives. And if you're at a party and you're thinking about getting in your car and your friends think you've drunk too much, they'll take the car keys off you. There'll be a big scene and no, yeah. one, no one will let you drive. So the people will do it more than like they get into trouble. Well, people don't want want to see their friends yeah, exactly, getting arrested. Exactly, yeah. you know? uh, so it's very very strict and and and. And here, coming here, I mean, 14 years ago, everyone was drink driving. Everyone. Uh, totally normal. Uh, I was kind of appalled, and then, you know, after a while, you kind of get into the swing of things, as it were. I probably shouldn't say that, but that's the way it is. You've yeah. got, got to adapt to the culture, right? You have to prescribe, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, about two years ago, they brought in... Um, and it was 0.08 here, so the law was the same as in the US. The problem yeah. was it wasn't enforced. So there was this really prevalent culture of drink driving. Two years ago, they kind of went to the other extreme of coming, bringing in zero tolerance, so you can no longer have any alcohol on your, on your breath if you're driving. Uh, it essentially means you can no longer have a glass of wine with your lunch, which I think is very bizarre in a country that's such a but major so wine producer. Wine, yeah. And yeah, I mean, Chile's wine consumption was dropping before. Uh, the U.S., on the other hand, has been increasing steadily for the past past few years. Uh, I think about five years ago we passed each other. Chile went below, dipped below 15 liters for the first time per capita, and America uh, increased above 15 liters. So we're at about 12 liters already. I think two years ago when uh, Tolerancia Cero came in, and it dropped dramatically straight straight away. It dropped to eight liters per capita. So wow. it's had a really major impact. So on it's, a, it's bad for your business, but good for safety, I guess. Uh, actually, it's interesting because I don't know if it is that great for safety. What's happened is Easter weekend was classic this year. Easter weekend, they had the highest road toll of any Easter weekend, I think, ever. And that's the drink driving thing wasn't the issue because all the crashes involved basically women who were driving sober because their husbands were too drunk to drive. But there's a woman who basically never drive. They have driver's licenses. And especially if you come into ski resorts, 
Oh, but Easter here doesn't fall in ski, ski season. So sorry about that. What's that? The Easter doesn't doesn't fall here no, in, no. in skiing season. No. I was talking about like that. The twist is still coming up to the ski resorts. No, 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 no. It wasn't wasn't related to people. Okay. Crashing on the way home from the ski fields. No, it was just I don't know like random crashes. But yeah, uh, yeah. I think it was a lot of people getting behind the wheel who don't normally drive. Probably with drunk, belligerent, machisto husbands uh, ordering them around, and you know whatever bad things happen. I guess. So kind of interesting. So what uh. Well, we're running out of time here, like a couple more minutes. What's uh, your recommendation for people from the states? Our audience is national in the states, uh, south, of, south, of, south of Canada, north of Mexico. People come here, what would they do? If they're going to come in summer, I would recommend they obviously going to fly into Santiago. I'd recommend they spend a couple of days in Valparaiso, which is only it's, it's an hour and a half's drive from Santiago. It's very close, it's right on the coast. Um, they can do beaches, but I think beaches in Chile are, are very pretty, but they're not the most exciting thing we have to offer. I would recommend people fly up north to San Pedro de Atacama, which is a lovely little uh, kind of, uh, it's a lovely little, what's the word, rustic town, I guess. Uh, it's a lot of adobe architecture, uh, dirt streets, and you know, some nice restaurants, but there's some great tours you can do out into the yeah. desert. Uh, the one thing that I've done a few times, which is brilliant, is a four-day, four uh, four-drive trip up into the onto the Altiplano in Bolivia. You cross into Bolivia, and you take four days to do a loop around the Salar de Uni, which is the biggest salt lake in the world. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely dramatic. The landscape's incredible. The sky yeah, is amazingly are, well, blue. We already crossed the border from Chile, so yeah. let's concentrate on Chile. And we're out of time. So very quickly, a website for uh, visit your winery. www.casasdelbosque.cl Excellent. Well, uh, Grand folks, thank you very much for your time. And uh, we just had lunch. We didn't drink anything. And you're going to drive, so drive safe. Uh, back to Valparaiso, okay? Cheers, man. No worries. Thank you. Have a good one. Este programa fue una producción de National Latino Broadcasting.